Moving Iron Podcast is proud to be part of the Global Ag Network. The network is live, so check out globalagnetwork.com for more details and updates. Now on to the show. Moving Iron in the 21st century. Hardworking people working hard for you and me. Moving Iron time and time again. Hello and welcome to Moving Iron Podcast Market Rundown with Chip Nellinger. Chip, how you doing tonight? Hey, pretty good. How are you, Casey? Doing good, man. Well, the report came out Friday and it was, uh, well, atrocious, I guess to say the least. It was uh, anything negative could have been there and it was there, man. That's... uh, it's an understatement. It was kind of worst case scenario for uh, for corn. It really was. Uh, and I think it all else being equal, uh, the, the acreage number up three point six six million acres. Um, I believe ninety two point uh, eight million acres. That was uh, probably acceptable, but the problem was the stock number, the quarterly stocks number, was just massive. Um, there were almost three hundred million bushels above the average estimate. Still, um, like. Six uh, percent lower than a year ago, but it was way, way bigger than the market thought, and uh, it has everyone scratching their head, wondering now, did the USDA uh, actually underestimate the crop size? The bad part of this is we got to wait another three months till June, right? Um, to kind of find out what the next tax report uh, is, and so that's a long, a long time frame. Um, but uh, yeah, we had some massive selling. Funds are massively short corn now. Uh, you know, probably closing in. Uh, there's some estimates uh, that uh, on Friday alone they sold between forty and fifty thousand contracts of corn. Wow. So uh, they got to be knocking on the door of a three hundred thousand contract short position. Uh, the good news is that's uh, that's a record. Uh, they've never been uh, that big of a short position in history, and um, they you know we've got the whole growing season ahead of us, and it's less than ideal. I mean, uh, it is uh, cold here. It snowed in northern Illinois here. Um, uh, yesterday, I believe, uh, you know, inch. We had plenty of rain here the last uh, four or five days. Uh, low, low to mid twenties for uh, overnight lows the last couple of nights. So uh, we are not uh, anywhere close to being ready to do any field work at this point. So, you know, um, best can be said is the funds have a massive short position. Um, hopefully, we can kind of digest and and pause here. Um, and, and not do too much damage to the downside um, because of that quarterly stocks number in corn. Uh, everything else was was fairly um, benign in there. Um, four and a half million less bean acres, uh, which was um, you know actually bigger than expected. But the bean stocks are massively bigger than a year ago, and that's not a surprise. It's not like uh, we didn't know that going into it. But it still just kind of underscores the fact that uh, we got a lot of beans, we got a lot of corn, and uh, yes, we've got some uncertainties getting the growing season started. But um, you know, until further notice, the funds are in in sell mode and wanting to short this thing. And uh, unfortunately, we're going to fight that uphill battle for a while um, until we um, you know have some sort of a of a spark. And that spark could be a lot of things. Uh, could be weather. Could be planning delays. Uh, could be China. We got some more talks scheduled. I believe Tuesday and Wednesday is when they're scheduled um, in Washington. Uh, it sounds like last week's talks went very well, but the market doesn't care at this point. Uh, they're they're done with the talk. They want to know uh, here is the final, uh, you know, the final agreement, and here's what um, line items, the quantities, and exact amounts and, and exact commodities. And products that China's going to take, and so all the rest of us just um, no waste at this point until we get some sort of agreement. Hopefully, um, you know it's possible that come this week, depending on how these talks go, uh, and that would be something that's a little bit of a game changer. If we can get that done. That's definitely going to uh, lift the, the lid a little bit on these grain markets. But until then, um, you know, unfortunately, these reports were were all fairly negative. Um, Quite honestly, I mean, they were, uh, they were other than the corn stocks. I think everything was 
not really um, a shock, but it just still kind of underscored we've got a lot of corn, a lot of beans, a lot of wheat, um, plenty of stocks. We're not going to run out anytime soon. And the funds are in sell mode. So, unfortunately, we're back to kind of the depressing uh, funds are going to sell every bounce type of a thing until further notice. All right. Okay, so <clears throat> you started off earlier with the with the um, – you know, talking about the report and, and, you know, it's one of those things where this is what I'm going to plant, but it could change, you know, who knows. But the downside to that, what you did mention was, you know, we don't know the stock report till three months from now and uh, in June. So, I mean, when, when will the, I guess, when will the market start kind of reading into what they're, what some of the scouts are saying or when they're doing some crop tours and those kind of things to to what they see planted versus what they hear you know what the stock report is yeah i I think that um you're already starting to see some of that Mm -hmm. um from the standpoint of um, it it is a slow start and and that's why i just despise uh, this march report from an acreage standpoint it was surveys taken as of the first of march obviously uh, a lot changes between the first of march and the end of march this year especially with all the flooding and and um you know the cold uh wet weather everyone seems to be having right now and so, uh, number one, that can change planting intentions. Number two, price can as well. So, you know, I, I don't know what we are now, 20-plus cents lower in corn than when we uh, did that survey. So price alone can, can dictate some acreage switching. And, uh, yeah, that's still very much up in the air. But unfortunately, just like the stocks number, we're not really going to get the next um, acreage snapshot until the end of June as well. So we've got to wait, um, you know, three more months for that. And obviously, at that point, the market's going to start making its own assumptions about how do we get planted, what's the planning pace, um, you know, where um, where's it raining, are we are we dry anywhere? Um, so that is important. And uh, honestly, you know, this uh, the rest of uh, April we're kicked off uh, with April tomorrow. So then it's going to be all about the next forecast that comes out. How much rain's in there? Are we going to dry out in Western Corn Belt? Allow some some field work to happen uh, here in the eastern Corn Belt. Um, so it will affect things, but it just seems like the market takes its sweet time and wants to see an actual problem. So we may still be four weeks away. We get, uh, you know, the first couple of, uh, of plantings reports, um, and, you know, by May 5th, May 10th, we're, we're really behind, and, and Iowa and the Dakotas and you guys in Nebraska aren't uh, – you know, make a progress, then the market might care, but uh, it'll be a it'll be a slow progression on that. Um, so it, it does matter, but unfortunately for a few weeks, it probably won't greatly affect um, the markets, unless it just goes dramatically. You know, if you get, just keep getting flooding rain after flooding rain in the Western Corn Belt, obviously that's going to affect things. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's never cut and dry like that. It's just as a progression and a it takes a while, and it, and it gets frustrating. Like, is the market ever going to respond to, to good news? And eventually it does, just like hogs. I mean, it's very similar to hogs. Um, you know, just had the African swine fever issues, and, you know, everybody knew that China was losing massive amounts of hogs, and the domestic hog prices were going up, and it seemed like every other day, you know, hog prices are in new lows, and just getting hammered, and then all of a sudden it did matter. So... You know, it, it does. It's frustrating to watch that, especially if you're out, um, you know, in the western Corn Belt, the Dakotas, or the flooded part of uh, Nebraska. You're like, great, corn's in the new contract lows, and, uh, you know, we've got the worst flooding uh, possibly in history. And it is frustrating, you know, and it does matter. It just takes a little while uh, for the market to uh, wrap its arms around the extent of the problem. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. So let's talk about the uh, livestock market here for a minute. So let's talk about you know Nebraska here. We've got quite a mess. We've got uh, severe flooding on the eastern side of the state, and we had a pretty massive blizzard come through the western side of the state. Um, and that that pretty much was all the way through Dakotas, all the way down into eastern Colorado. Um, well, basically the whole state of Colorado got got a little piece of that. But um, I keep hearing this uh, this million head of cattle loss that that kind of gets keep tossed around a little bit but the uh, cattle market hasn't really responded to that at all what's your opinion of that and and how do you see that working out well it did a little bit i mean um when that number first came out 
Um, I'm not sure if it was uh, uh, Secretary Purdue or a, or a Nebraska State um, uh, Agriculture uh, Secretary. I'm not sure which one, but they did come out with that, and, and, the, and the cattle market did respond us up sharply. Uh, I think that's the day we put our highs in. Part of the problem is it's kind of the opposite in cattle than it is in uh, corn right now. Funds are really close to a record long. Um, we have been rallying on this news, so some of that's digested in there. Um, carcass weights continue to go lower, and that's still as a result of uh, all the horrendous uh, feeding conditions that we've had all winter long. And so it is affecting it, um, but at a certain point, you know, you get far enough along with the market. Uh, it's a futures market, and it has the, the most bullish or bearish news digested into it. And, and that's my fear of the cattle markets. Um, we did support pretty well. Um, and, and really what seemed to support us was when they came out with uh, those carcass weights and uh, they were down pretty dramatically. Uh, so that really helped, helped support us. So, you know, things won't go up forever. We're at pretty lofty levels. I think there's room for us to go up, but you know, when the funds decide to get out, I mean, the, the hog market's case in point. You know, just, you, if you haven't, if you're waiting for higher prices, you're waiting for higher prices, um, you got to act, you got to execute at some point in time because when it turns, it'll turn so fast that you don't have time uh, to react. So um, I think in, in the case of cattle, we just have to keep that in the back of our minds and, and, uh, and have a plan. Obviously, we, we can uh, make a stab at what um, cost of gain is and break evens. And obviously, um, you know, those have been a little bit uh, underestimated because of the, the horrible winter we've had. But we are getting into some areas on the thirds, or have been, uh, at the highs that, you know, start making some sense and, and probably bear uh, watching and, and making some decisions out there. Um, but, uh, you know, it'll be, uh, you know, one thing is for certain, we talk about this a lot uh, on this podcast, and that's volatility. We haven't seen a whole lot of it other than Friday in the grain markets, but the cattle market and the hog market definitely are starting to get uh, volatile. And uh, there's going to be big swings, there already have been, up and down. Hogs are a case in point. Hogs, uh, you know, had a Hogs and Pigs report out. That's a, um, a quarterly report. Uh, last week it was a little bit negative. So there's big numbers out there, and that seemed to take the air out of the hog market a little bit. And, uh, in fact, we uh, closed the limit down one day. We were sharply lower Friday. and kind of came back off the lows a little bit. Uh, but just goes to show you, man, we tacked 25 bucks on hogs and took about, uh, I don't know, uh, eight out of them in uh, two and a half days' time. So, and, and there's nothing to say that the highs are even in yet. So you're starting to see some really exciting uh, volatile markets, uh, at least in the in the livestock sector. And, uh, and the good news is, if there's any bright spot, uh, it, it maybe is in the livestock sector, at least from a profitability standpoint, you're looking at, uh, you know, what, uh, probably second, third, highest hog levels for summer months we've ever had. Um, you know, we, we've had a huge rally up in cattle. And, um, you know, if there is a bright spot in ag, it's at least that, you know, hog prices have rebounded and cattle prices are, are, are strong here, even though it's been really challenging, um, and, you know, from the <coughs> feeding perspective. Uh, hopefully we can get a little bit of life back in the, the grain markets and give those guys uh, something to, to smile about because it's getting a little depressing over there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so how much of the uh, what you see happening with, with beef and what you see happening with maybe some poultry, stuff like that, I mean, the hog number is such a big number that China has to, to fill that void now, and it's getting worse every day. Um, could you see some support in the beef market just because of, of you know people looking at other sources of protein other than, than, than hog markets over there? Yeah, I, I think so, and you might already be seeing some of that. Um, you know, obviously, this China agreement's been uh, pretty well documented. Will it happen um, uh, or not? Um, hopefully, sooner rather than later. But you know, there's a reason to believe that that could uh, include a little bit of U.S. beef as well. Um, so, absolutely, I think that's already starting to to support things a little bit uh, from a, a consumption standpoint, a demand standpoint. Um, you know, and, and these markets will respond if you start getting some confirmation of a, of a trade agreement with some exact tonnages. Um, 
you know, the cattle market, the hog market will respond really quickly. And that's the great news about these markets. We just need to get that spark of news out and get it finalized. And I think you'll be looking at, it should spur some short covering. Just the news alone should spur some short covering in the grain markets to give us, you know, some sort of a balance. If it happens to coincide with continuing wet weather, you can maybe build something and get a bigger rebound. But absolutely, it's critically important with what's going on in China. It sounds like it's not gotten any better. There were some, you know, it's a shot in the dark. It's anyone's guess at this point exactly how bad it is. But I heard some talk last week that, you know, it might be up to half their hog herd. So it's whatever it is, whether it's 20%, 40%, 50%, big, big numbers. And it's going to take them a while to fix it. It's going to take them a while to rebuild and repopulate. And all the while, they've got a lot of mouths to feed. And, you know, that's why every Thursday on the export sales report, you know, and up to this point, the livestock sales, the meat sales have kind of been a little bit of an afterthought usually. But boy, not anymore. I mean, it is closely scrutinized to see is China in there for pork, how much. And it's going to create a lot of volatility every Thursday morning when those export sales reports are released. Yep. Yep. There's a ton of stuff going on, a ton of stuff going on right now. Um, just so much volatility and not so much volatility as there is. It could just go one way or the other at any time. So having that plan is a very important thing to have. And if, if folks have a plan that they're working on or want to have you help them do one, how would they do that, Chip? Yeah, it, uh, it is critically important. It's about to get busy. Um, that's, uh, you, you know, spring field work, planting. And typically your, your spring high um, in uh, corn and beans comes around the 1st of May, give or take a, a week or, or, or so, 10 days on either side of that. That's a busy time for farmers, so you have to have a plan, and, and you can't take your eyes off the ball because these markets can change so fast. So uh, we'd love to chat with you here ahead of uh, planting. Um, our office number is 309-550-7213, and uh, we'd love to uh, just chat with you on what your plan is and how we might be able to, uh, to help you. Right on. Well, I want to say one thing before we shut it down here. I got to tell my mom happy birthday. So happy, uh, happy birthday, mom! You're 28 again. So love you. We'll yeah, talk to you soon. Hey, happy birthday! <laughs> right on, right on. All right, Chip. Well, we'll uh, talk to you again next week. Till then, have a good one. And uh, something crazy pops up, we'll give you a shout. Okay, that sounds good. Thanks a lot. See you, man. Thanks for listening to this edition of the Moving Iron Podcast, now part of the Global Ag Network. If you'd like to continue any of these conversations, you can hit me up on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram at Moving Iron LLC. You can also send me an email at Moving Iron Podcast at Moving Iron Podcast.com. You can also visit the Moving Iron Podcast YouTube channel and watch Market Roundup with Chip Nellinger, Sean Hackett, and Angie Setzer. Also, Tax Moves with Glenn Birnbaum. Please visit movingironllc.com. Here you can find information, details, and updates for the 2019 Moving Iron Summit in Nashville, Tennessee. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can leave a review and subscribe at iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, TuneIn Radio, SoundCloud, and globalagnetwork.com. So until next time, let's go move some iron. This is Casey Seymour, out. Moving iron in the 21st century. Hardworking people working hard for you and me. Moving higher, time and time again. Through the years, you'll find us here. Moving higher.